What's going on guys? This is JK Whited from the Baseball Rebellion here to do this week's breakdown and this week I have chosen to do Stan the Man Musual. I have gone back in time once again. I love doing this. It's one of my favorite things to do is, is go back and look at some old school players and, and see the relationships between you know what the, the best guys of different eras do compared to the best guys of today. And I think you're going to see some really cool stuff here. And uh, obviously, Stan the Man, one of the best players of all time, played 20 years, uh, 20 something, you know, 20 uh, All Star games and three MVPs, crazy numbers. Uh, the guy struck out maybe 30 times a year, high batting averages in the 300s to 330, even higher sometimes, and never really hit below that. Um, you know, not a very big strikeout guy. And it's probably what led to some of his. His numbers as well being, uh, you know, more more consistency and average. You know, hit 30 home runs or so once. I think uh, I will put down a, a link at the, uh, the below the video that you guys can go to and check out some more of his numbers. But obviously, you don't play for that long with those kind of numbers if you're not any good. And and one of the craziest things too is that you know he took a year off and was in the military uh, to fight in, in the war. So, at, you know, that's something that guys don't really realize today. Some of these best players didn't even have two or three years in their stats because they were all fighting. So, uh, obviously, uh, super cool that he was, he went and did that. So let's go ahead and start, uh, with this swing here. And, you know, I go through as much video as I can to try to get a feel for the consistency of what he does. And, and really from the, you know, just like guys today, the waist down, uh, of, of this generation of player I think is really really good compared to some of the other guys you know we, the players we have today are are, are bigger and, and may not have to to generate as much and I know I've said this before any of you newcomers uh, watching this video today uh, can learn a little bit about how how efficiency and timing and momentum uh, play a part in, in the swing and we're going to really look at the waist down at the beginning like I said and, and kind of see how his engines work and now in this particular uh, portion of the video he's already kind of got his feet a little bit closer together and kind of tipped the barrel in so this is kind of the the pre-go the pre-forward position that you know you're going to see a lot of these players of this decade and especially um you know in the 30s where their feet are really close together and they hold their hands really low with a little bit of a hunch you're going to see that that angle between his you know front shoulder and, and his pelvis and his knee kind of a little bit of a hunch here um just kind of you know gearing up a little bit here i wouldn't say that's the best way to do it but uh, it can create some problems and kind of rotational problems. The more you hunch over, kind of the harder it is to, to, to turn open and to rotate. But he's going to get out of it pretty well here. So here we go. And one of the first things people notice is, is that momentum going forward. So he really allows himself to get through the box. I mean, you can use stuff in the background if you're a, a player or a coach watching this for the first time and just kind of watch him kind of move from, you know, where he is to where he gets to when his front foot hits the ground. So there's definitely four momentum happening in in this swing right here and he does that because you know he was six foot tall 100 uh 175 pounds i think is what i read and uh so that's not incredibly big and these parks are still big and and he had a wood bat so he had to get something going and he did that very well here and then as he goes to you know go once he's made his decision and the decision making process happens uh, with the foot in the air and so once your foot's down it's pretty much go time unless you might be adjusting to an off speed pitch and this is definitely a fastball coming in so He's already made up his mind, and as he goes to start the swing, he really lets his front side open up nicely. And again, it's not perfect, but um, you know, a lot of you guys might have you know, seen Josh Donaldson on, on MLB TV talking about this and how it kind of you know, broke the brains of some of his, um, the guys interviewing him. And uh, this is just something you want to allow to, have, to happen in the swings. If you have a young player or an old player who does this, it's okay. Now, how you use it and when you use it is important, but it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Just like a thrower needs to open up his front side and lower half to allow the hips to rotate easily and comfortably and efficiently, um, it's really important that you allow your player to do that. And again, it's not open, open here, but again, the allowancing of the front foot. Uh, many players like myself included were told not to do that. In fact, there was times where they put stuff in front of my feet to keep me from, from doing that and uh, ultimately causing you know, some strain on the knees and the ankle joints, things like that. So as he goes to open up, we can really see the, uh, you know, the ability to turn his hips and how important that is because through the rest of the turn, he's using that front side to push back so he can really pull that backside from behind him. So as he starts to turn, again, looking from the waist down only right now, we can really see his back knees start to bend. Uh, his back foot starts to come off the ground as well. That's again, just like the front foot was allowed to open up, the back foot is allowed 
to pull forward as opposed to forcing it. Now, if you're a young player learning how to do this for the first time, you know, it might feel a little bit forced when you pull that back foot, but uh, over time it will become a little bit more of a natural feel. So again, really efficient lower half here. If we get the contact, we can clearly see the hip extension right here through contact where he kind of pushes his butt towards the ball a little bit here to get a little bit of that, that extra boost right there as he turns into it. Uh, we can see that front leg really straightening out from that bent position, and you can see his back knee clearly bent, really up on his tiptoe here, uh, but you can see him, he'll kind of fall back on it a little bit towards the end. And these guys were vicious and violent swingers, and, and you saw a lot of, uh, you know, swings and misses and falls and falling down, but, you, you know, Stan the man clearly uh, does a great job of, of using his lower half here. So when we work up the swing, we're going to start to look at things like barrel path and, and kind of how his shoulders move and, and how the barrel moves. And one thing that a lot of guys at this time period did is they started with their hands really low kind of down here below their shoulder kind of tucked in with that elbow already kind of preset behind them and one thing that he does really well if you look at how the bat is, is positioned right here this is called a tip where he's kind of tipped in towards the catcher a little bit uh, when his when his front leg and his front foot come uh, close together with his back foot and I want you to really pay attention to how his bat moves okay notice how as he opens up the bat and his back elbows and shoulders move behind him so that the barrel can start to generate speed behind his back shoulder back here. So he's not trying to wait till contact to get up to speed because you can't, you can't do that. You've got to have some distance and some time to generate speed. Now we don't have a lot of time, so the faster you can create bat speed and the earlier you can create your maximum bat speed is super important. And this is where why knob to the ball and information like that is terrible because and I think where it got confusing for a lot of coaches, uh, you know, when you started seeing still pictures like this where you can clearly say, hey, well, look, yeah, he's trying to take his knob to the ball. Well, that, that may be true in a still picture, but he's not actually doing that uh, in motion. He's turning the knob. So by the time he gets the bat around his shoulder, that knob is turning. So when he gets to the ball, he's already behind it back here, back here, and back here. So he's able to really get his barrel behind the ball and not only in the way of the ball but also super fast so if we see the ball coming in here we can tell from right about here he's behind the ball so you can see the path of the ball right towards the catcher's mitt obviously the guy who will be catching it and then we can clearly see stands back coming from around his shoulder okay in the way of the ball right here so he's got all this distance you know, he's got all this space right here where he can connect with the ball, and here he does right here in the middle. A pretty optimal contact position. His arms aren't too straight, so he's hitting the ball with some flexion in his elbows and doing a really good job of it. And that's a that's something that really makes guys better hitters. I'm telling you right now, if you can create this position right here where you get to your front side with an open front side, but also kind of keeping that head a little bit you know, behind your belly button on that back hip, and as you turn you can get that barrel fast and in the way of the ball. And it's so annoying for pitchers because they can throw a really hard pitch or an off-speed pitch or your timing can be a little bit off, but you still hit the barrel. And I think that's what, you know, looking back at a lot of swings I saw of Stan, you know, the, uh, the ability to get the bat in the way of the ball was there every time, every video I saw. it, And that's probably why he hit over 300 all the time and, and rarely struck out. You know, his home run numbers weren't, um, you know, weren't super, super eye catching. You know, he hit a lot of them, but at the same time, he never really had like a Babe Ruth year where he hit like 60 or anything like that. And that's okay. You know, that's fine. You know, I think his shoulders are a little bit flat. As you can see, his rotation, he kind of stands up out of it. So instead of having that more of that Ferris wheel type of a swing, we see a little bit more of a merry go round. So as he gets in the way of the ball, and this is a little bit higher pitch as well. Um, you know, obviously the pitching wasn't as good as it is today, and then I would say probably in general more balls were kind of left up like this. Uh, but you can see how as he turns, the bat is a little bit, you know, around his belly button, kind of around the center of him, but and and not quite as uphill, kind of like the Griffey logo and the Swingman, the Swingman logo and the Trouts and the guys like that who can really stay in that deep side bend back here. You know, you can clearly see the back shoulder down and the front shoulder up here in this position, but he kind of sits up out of it and his arms go down to meet it. And he gets a little bit flat. So again, this is a hit. Obviously you can see the ball coming off the bat a little bit flatter. That's not the optimal home run degree right there unless he hit it 200 miles an hour, which I don't think happened. Um, so this is maybe kind of a line drive hit, I would suppose right here, but again, it's just kind of flat. And I think maybe his swings were maybe a little bit flatter than they could have been a little bit more uphill. But uh, again, very efficient swing. 
And, and the four momentum part, really big. I'll play it through for you guys right here. And the really more impressive thing and, and the harder thing to train, uh, but definitely doable if you put enough time and effort into it and know how to do it, is keeping that bat moving. His bat never stops. So from the tip in, as he opens his hips, the shoulders catch, and they bring that bat from around his shoulder, and that bat never stops moving. So that's pretty optimal. That's pretty high efficiency of a swing right there and uh, very fun to watch. So again, this is Stan Musial. And go back and, and, you know, he played in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. He played a long time. And go back and look at video from some of our other breakdowns that Chaz has done and Gabe and myself and, and take a peek at, at, you know, these positions that these guys get to. And they're very, very similar. There is there is a best way to swing the bat. There are the best ways to move and position the barrel like you see right here. Like this is a position that you see you know, Jock Peterson get in. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've seen Jock Peterson in this exact same position. And we're talking about, you know, guys that have been separated for a long time and years and, you know, baseball and hitting is the same. It really is. And how you start and kind of how you finish sometimes can be different, but there is a best way for everybody to swing the bat. And there's a reason why the best all do it. And, uh, and swinging from that and turning from that back hip, getting uphill and, and, and not being afraid of making mistakes. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Please leave a comment below and uh, check out some of his stats. Go ahead and check out some more of his swings and compare him to some of your favorite players of the day. And, and remember that, you know, this guy, off, you know, took a year off and, and fought for our country and uh, was still be able to put up, you know, big numbers the rest of his career for a long time because this is a swing that lasts. This is a swing that lasts through time and and you know at, at, at any level of baseball whether you're six years old or, or 26 so again guys thanks for watching thanks for reading and i'll see you next time thanks